It's been a pretty long time since the last installment in this series. I was planning for the next video to be about the deaths of world leaders, but since that one will require more research, I'll hold off on that one for now. In this video, there's a mixed bag of people from different backgrounds and different circumstances, but what they all had in common was that they wouldn't survive the 1920s. Calvin Coolidge served as president for a majority of the 1920s and is closely associated with the decade. He was known as Silent Cow, and while that is a bit of an exaggeration, there was something he was very silent about. The death of his son, Calvin Jr. It all started on a hot day on June 30th, 1924, outside on the south grounds of the White House. The temperature that day rose to 91 degrees Fahrenheit, pretty hot for Washington, D.C. A game of lawn tennis was played between 16-year-old Calvin Jr., the president's favorite son, and his 17-year-old brother, John. Calvin Jr. went out in his bare feet, perhaps because of the heat. The press was also present to capture photos of the presidential family. Perhaps because of this, President Coolidge wanted his sons to look presentable, as they usually did at home. So they played in wool suits, despite the high temperature. Nothing out of the ordinary happened, and everyone went home happy. It was a busy time for President Coolidge, as he was preparing for the Republican National Convention that was less than two weeks away and the upcoming presidential campaign. He had just been nominated for president two weeks earlier and was expected to win an easy victory, as he was quite popular. But with all of this going on, within a few days, it was discovered that Calvin Jr. had developed a blister on the top of the third toe on his right foot. It was caused by all of the friction his bare foot had made with the ground during the tennis match and the blister had become infected and turned dark. The boy was limping, had a fever, was swollen in the groin area, and had red streaks running down his legs. A doctor was immediately consulted, and the boy's condition was recognized quickly as being very, very serious. In time, it would be diagnosed as sepsis, blood poisoning. Antibiotics were still a few years away, so there was little that could be done in terms of treatment. The president was understandably distraught and was now very distracted from fulfilling his political duties, rushing back and forth from his office to his son's sickbed. Charles Dawes, who was running on President Coolidge's ticket as the vice presidential candidate, happened to be in the White House at this time. As he passed Calvin Jr.'s sick room, he saw the president bent over the bed. He later described what he saw. I have never witnessed such a look of agony and despair as it was on the president's face. The newspapers got a hold of the story, though it was announced that there would be no formal bulletins released by the White House or the Coolidge family. President Coolidge was already a very private man, and this cut deeper into his emotions than anything else before. The President's and the nation's birthday on July 4th were virtually forgotten by the Coolidges. President Coolidge wrote a short letter to his father in Vermont, saying, Calvin is very sick, so this is not a happy day for me. The next day, Calvin Jr. was transferred to the nearby Walter Reed Army Hospital, where he received the best treatment the country could offer. He was given sedatives and risky surgery was performed in an attempt to drain the poison. And while the operation was a success, it also wasn't certain if it had actually helped. But it quickly became clear that the sepsis was quickly spreading and further surgery would be futile. And the doctors came to the conclusion that only a miracle could save the president's son. So all they could do was wait and hope. As with many cases of serious illnesses, Calvin Jr.'s condition improved slightly before taking a sharp, cruel turn for the worse, and he slipped in and out of consciousness. The next day, July 7th, at 10.30pm, Calvin Coolidge Jr. died with his parents at his bedside. John had remained at the White House. The news was announced over the radio for Madison Square Garden, and the ongoing Democratic National Convention adjourned out of respect for the president. The effect of Calvin Jr.'s death on his father's presidency was immense, though the president almost never spoke about it directly. But through his personal policy of strict privacy, there are some pretty clear hints at how this affected him. In his short autobiography, the president devoted only one line to the matter. When he went, the power and the glory of the presidency went with him. 
It is believed that President Coolidge fell into a deep depression for the remainder of his presidency, and contributed to his famous decision not to run again in 1928. As for the 1924 election, the wheels of motion were already turning, so he accepted an easy win in four more years as president, but had to endure it without his favorite son. He later made a touching comment to a friend about Calvin Jr. that might also double as a sign of his mental anguish at the cause of his death. He said, When I look out that window, I always see my boy playing tennis on that court out there. I've already made a short video about this next one, but since that was a long time ago, I thought I would include it here too. And since that first video, I found out about some more details. This story involves a man named Ray Chapman, who played shortstop for the Cleveland Indians Major League Baseball team. On August 16, 1920, the Indians were playing the New York Yankees at the Polo Grounds. At the top of the fifth inning, Ray Chapman, nicknamed Chappie, a popular player among fans, was the first batter pitted against the skilled pitcher Carl Mays, who used a very low submarine delivery, as you can see in this film. The first pitch struck Chapman on the left side of his head. The sound of the impact was so loud that the pitcher, Mays, thought that the ball had hit the handle of the bat. This might explain why Mays didn't walk over to check if Chapman was okay, fielding the ball instead. Tommy Connolly, the home plate umpire, noticed blood coming from Chapman's ear and immediately called for a doctor in the stands and two doctors rushed onto the field. The crowd became silent as Chapman was being examined. He stumbled up to his feet with assistance and was walked to the visitor's clubhouse, where he lost consciousness, and was carried the rest of the way by two teammates. Although the uncertain fate of Chapman left many fans and players anxious, the game would be finished, the Indians gaining an important victory on their way to the World Series. Chapman was rushed to St. Lawrence Hospital, located half a mile from the polo grounds, where his head was x-rayed, with the fear that his skull had been fractured. A surgeon, Dr. T. M. Merrigan, made the decision to operate. Here is a description of the injury as reported in the New York Times on August 18, 1920. The blow had caused a depressed fracture in Chapman's head three and a half inches long. Dr. Merrigan removed a piece of skull about an inch and a half square, and found the brain had been so severely jarred that blood clots had formed. The shock of the blow had lacerated the brain not only on the left side of the head where the ball struck, but also on the right side where the shock of the blow had forced the brain against the skull, Dr. Merrigan said. According to reports, Chapman had his future planned out. If the Indians won the World Series, he would retire from baseball and go into business in Cleveland, and would be able to spend more time with his wife, who he had married only the year before, and the child that they were expecting. Here is another excerpt from the New York Times. Before the game, the player had placed in the trainer's custody his diamond ring, a gift from his wife. Several times, the stricken man tried to say, ring, but he could not speak. He pointed to his finger. The operation lasted over an hour, ending at 1.44 in the morning. Chapman would die three hours later at 4.40. He was 29 years old, and left behind his wife and unborn daughter. Chapman's pregnant wife had been called at the beginning, before the seriousness of the injury was apparent. She arrived in New York at 10 a.m., but it was already too late. A priest who was also Chapman's friend took Mrs. Chapman to a hotel to tell her about her husband's death, and she fainted. Chapman's coffin was shown in New York for a few hundred people, including players from both the Indians and the Yankees, where, it was said, there was not a dry eye among the scores of men who thronged the room about the beer. Carl Mays, the pitcher who threw the fatal pitch, voluntarily participated in the investigation, and he was recorded as saying, It is the most regrettable incident of my baseball career. I would give anything if I could undo what has happened. Chapman was a game, splendid fellow. There were suspicions against Mays, because he had a controversial habit of hitting players on purpose, or at least trying to buzz them around the head in order to intimidate them. But Mays claimed he had stopped doing that, and that that was not what had happened with Chapman. He said that the ball had had a rough spot on it, which made it turn unexpectedly. At that time, there was considerable debate over spitballs, which meant using saliva, dirt, or other substances to make the ball move erratically and unpredictably when thrown by a pitcher, 
Maze had been notorious for utilizing these techniques. Even though Maze obviously hadn't wanted to kill anyone on purpose, not everyone believed that he was entirely blameless, and players from the Boston Red Sox and the Detroit Tigers, among others, called for him to be banned from baseball. The president of the American League, Ban Johnson, decided not to take further action on Mays, believing that it had truly been an accident. A lot of ugly rumors circulated about Mays, and many, if not all of them, were of dubious reliability. The Yankees manager, Miller Huggins, said that he believed Chapman's shoe spike had caught on something in the dirt at home plate, preventing him from moving out of the way of the ball. An Indians pitcher, Ray Caldwell, said that Chapman had seemed to duck into the path of the ball, and if he hadn't moved, he would probably have been hit in the shoulder. Indians player slash manager Tris Speaker called for peace toward Mays, saying, It is the duty of all of us, of all the players, not only for the good of the game, to suppress all bitter feelings. We will do all in our power to avoid aggravating the unfortunate impression in any way. Chapman's funeral was held in Cleveland on August 20th. Carl Mays went into seclusion for a little while and did not join the Yankees when they went to Cleveland for three games. Plans for a memorial for Chapman in Cleveland began immediately, and money was raised through a local Cleveland newspaper. More than 15,000 people donated 10 cents each. A bronze plaque was made and displayed shortly after at League Park. In February 1921, Chapman's wife gave birth to Ray's daughter, who she named Ray, spelled R-A-E almost certainly in honor of the father she would never meet. Immediately after Chapman's tragic death, rules for safety gear were considered. At least one manager, Pat Moran of the Philadelphia Phillies, distributed protective headgear to his players in 1921, but ultimately the decision was left to each team. Batting helmets were not required throughout Major League Baseball until the 1950s. Ray Chapman remains the only Major League Baseball player to die from on-field injuries. Unfortunately, there was more tragedy for Ray Chapman's family. His wife, Kathleen, did remarry, but still suffered from depression as a result of Ray's sudden death. In 1928, she committed suicide by drinking poison. The next year, Ray's daughter, Ray, died of measles at only 8 years old. Whether or not you like the 1920s, you have to admit, they were very unkind to Ray Chapman and his family. But there were some pieces of good news. The Cleveland Indians would go on to win the World Series two months after Chapman's death, and the team dedicated their victory to him. And most recently, in 2007, the original 1920 Ray Chapman memorial plaque was rediscovered, after being completely forgotten in storage for decades. Although the plaque was in poor condition, it was meticulously cleaned, and is now displayed at Progressive Field in Cleveland, hopefully never to be neglected again. The next person was closely associated with the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922 by Howard Carter. Lord Carnarvon was, as you might have guessed by his title, born into a prominent and wealthy British family. He was in a serious car accident in the very early days of the invention, all the way back in 1903. The injuries would last in some form for the rest of his life. Due to these injuries, a doctor recommended that he recuperate somewhere abroad during winter, so Lord Carnarvon and his wife went to Egypt where he caught Egyptology fever, a fairly common hobby for wealthy European men at the time. In 1907, Lord Carnarvon funded an excavation in Egypt, where he met Howard Carter. The two men continued to work together, and even jointly wrote a book about their findings. In 1914, they began their excavations of the Valley of the Kings, where many Egyptian pharaoh's tombs had already been discovered. It was believed that there was little of interest left to be found, though they both were especially keen on finding the tomb of the boy king, Tutankhamun. After years of searching, they had turned up little. Lord Carnarvon decided that 1922 would be the last year he would sponsor excavation efforts there. But on November 4th of that year, at the 11th hour, Carter sent a telegram to Lord Carnarvon, saying that he had discovered a tomb that appeared to be undisturbed. Less than three weeks later, Lord Carnarvon and his daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert, arrived at the site. A few days later, Carter was able to peer into the tomb through a small hole he had made, resulting in the famous scene when Lord Carnarvon asked, Do you see anything? 
to which Carter replied, Yes, wonderful things. On March 19, 1923, Lord Carnarvon was bitten by a mosquito on his right cheek while in the Valley of the Kings, then accidentally cut the wound with a razor blade while shaving. He apparently didn't think it was anything to be concerned about, but he would quickly know how serious it really was. The wound immediately became infected, and eventually developed into blood poisoning of the head and neck. Only two and a half weeks later, on April 5th, he died at a hotel in Cairo, Egypt, and his body was sent back to England to be buried. His death is closely related to the so-called Mummy's Curse. There was a belief among some people that ancient Egyptians had used magic spells that would curse anyone who stepped foot in a pharaoh's sacred tomb. A less supernatural idea was that the ancient Egyptians had placed poison in the tomb that would have killed an intruder through more worldly means. One clue that people pointed to was that Howard Carter had written to a friend a few days before Lord Carnarvon's death, This tomb has brought us bad luck. Keep in mind that while the 1920s was a modern era, superstition still abounded, evidenced most clearly in the spiritualist movement that remained fairly popular throughout much of the decade. One of the leaders of the spiritualist movement was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He was quoted as saying, A malevolent spirit may have caused Lord Carnarvon's fatal illness. He went on to say, I think it is possible that some occult influence caused his death. There are many legends about the powers of the old Egyptians, and I know I wouldn't care to go fooling about their tombs and mummies. There have been other instances of persons who met with unfortunate ends under similar circumstances. We know that all the powers of the ancient Egyptians were used to guard their mummies, and they must have had great powers. Of course, I don't say that some Egyptian spirit did kill Carnarvon, but I think it is possible. There are many malevolent spirits. There was a mummy in the British Museum which became noted because of the series of misfortunes which befell those who had anything to do with it. The excavators, the workmen who carried it, the photographers who photographed it, and others seemed to be pursued by an evil influence. Though certainly not everyone in the spiritualist movement agreed with him, and they said so. Virtually everyone in the Egyptology community and overall academic community quickly dismissed such beliefs in the mummy's curse pointing to a long list of archaeologists who had excavated ancient Egyptian tombs and had nothing bad happen to them. Not to mention Howard Carter, who was in the same place as Lord Carnarvon at the same time, and had even gone as far as to look upon the face of the dead King Tut, something that Lord Carnarvon had not been able to do. And then there were all the tomb robbers over the years who hadn't died mysteriously. In a 1934 letter, Howard Carter claimed that the Pharaoh's Curse story was invented by a journalist and rival Egyptologist named Arthur Weigel. Carter himself called the curse rumor to be Tommy Rot. Unfortunately, the story of the curse will always be connected with Lord Carnarvon's death, even if there was no truth to it. In the end, the tale of the mummy's curse was just a more interesting one than a simple infected mosquito bite and some people just don't want to believe that an important person had died from something so unsensational. The discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb was an international sensation, and while Lord Carnarvon wasn't constantly excavating at the site like Carter, he played a very important role by making it all possible through his wealth and patience. But unfortunately, he wouldn't live long enough to experience just how influential the discovery became. I hope you enjoyed this video and that it was worth the wait. The next installment is definitely coming sometime, but like I said before, it will require more research, since they're world leaders and the effects of their deaths often had wider implications for nations, regions, or even much of the world. And I also think it's good to space out the sad, morbid stories so this channel isn't constantly depressing. Well, anyway, that's all for now all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more Tales from the Jazz Age.